All right, so um, we're going to go directly into some JavaScript so that we get this experience about how do we um, create something interactive, how do we debug something when it goes wrong. This stuff always goes wrong, unfortunately. We're going to run into the issues about what is a logic error versus what is a syntax error. One is easier to debug and troubleshoot than the other. Uh, so we'll look at, at possibly both kinds of errors and we'll see what happens. So. The way the class works is, remember, we're going to use, um, we can use any kind of code editing software, but what's the one I recommended last time? Notepad++. Notepad++. Yes, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in my flash drive. Uh, if you haven't plugged in your flash drive, you should do so when the class starts. And if you didn't bring a flash drive, you'll be able to save your stuff to the desktop, but you will need to take the work with you before you leave. All of the computers on campus, or I think most of the computers on campus, have a software called Deep Freeze, which is that when you restart a computer, it actually resets to our factory settings. So if you didn't save your work on your own flash drive, or you didn't email it to yourself, it will be gone. So if you left something here on the desktop last time, it's gone. Whenever these computers are restarted, it resets. So just make sure you've got your stuff being saved on a flash drive or you put it on your Google Drive or your Dropbox or you email it to yourself at the end of the day. So we're going to use Notepad++. Go ahead and go to your Start menu and search for Notepad++ and launch it. You want to use Notepad++, not Notepad. Plain old Notepad uh, doesn't work for us very well. It's a very simple co uh, It's a very simple text editor. We want a more civilized code editor like Notepad++ or brackets, Sublime, Atom, there's a ton of code editors out there. Uh, I believe I might have forgotten last week to mention if you're going home and then you're going to do this on a Mac, there's no Notepad++ on a Mac, but there's a bunch of other great alternatives like brackets, uh, Microsoft Visual Code, Sublime, Text Wrangler, etc., Dreamweaver, etc. If you need uh, specific help with that on your Mac, of course, you're always free to email me or bring your Mac and help and ask in class, and I'll help you out. So go ahead and launch Notepad++. If you get any pop-ups about updates, just cancel these. You're going to get all of these as soon as the app starts up because, you know, with our deep freeze, things are locked. And if there's updates, if you do your update, it will reset. It'll go away once you restart the computer, so that's just something we need to get used to. Cancel it if it asks for any updates. We'll go up to the File menu, New. We have a brand new blank document, and we'll go to File, Save As. And I'm going to save this to my flash drive. So you save it to your flash drive, or the desktop, or wherever you're going to keep it. And our file name will be todaysdate.html. Make sure you change the save as type. I noticed for a few people last time it didn't quite seem to work. You might have forgotten to change it right here. We're not saving this as normal text. We're saving this as HTML. So file name todaysdate.html. Zero two zero six and .html, and then ch make sure your save as type is HTML. As I, <coughs> as I said, in the beginning, things are, are, are going to be at a more sedate pace, and then as time goes on, we'll get a little faster. So if you've got experience in all of this, um, you, know, you just need to uh, hang, hang, hang back a bit, and we'll get eventually to the more advanced stuff. So save this file, .html, save as type, HTML. We're starting with a brand new blank document, so that gives us a chance to create our basic skeleton of an HTML file. Once we've created that skeleton, then we'll save it as a sort of a template so that we have to start all over every time. So our skeleton template is angle bracket doc type space HTML, HTML pairs, head pairs, body pairs, uh, 
Again, very quickly, I'm not going to say less than, HTML greater than, press enter, tab, less than, head greater than. I'm not going to say each individual character very quickly because we see that the basic syntax of HTML is like this. There's a tag, which is surrounded by angle brackets. 99% of the time, a tag then has a pair. So if I were to click once on HTML, it should highlight its pair. And its pair is closed with a slash. And the slash has to be at the beginning of the word between the angle brackets. Anywhere else that you put that slash, it's not correct. Even though it may seem like it's kind of working, that's not correct at the end there. And it's also not correct to have it outside of the angle brackets. Your closing tag, 99% of the time, looks like that. We have another tag here, title. Uh, we'll do basic JavaScript input, output. Inside of the main body, heading one, to make a big old title that will appear on screen, we'll call this simple name retrieval system. Yes? Very good point. Yes, forgot to do that. Thank you. Yes, good point. 99% of the time, we need the closing tags. I was about to forget it. Maybe I did that on purpose, because that's, <laughs> because that's to remind us. Remember, when I teach this stuff, I always recommend open and close your tags. I was about to forget it. I honestly was. But I'll say that I did it on purpose so that we can remember to close our tags. Now, you may have had experience in other code editors that closes the code for you. And Notepad does do it for you, but I've deactivated that. So we do it the hard way first. And then I'll show you the, the little option you can turn on so that it closes the tags for you so you don't forget. But in the beginning, I think it's more important to do it the long way, the, the harder way, so that you get the basics. And then you can use the shortcuts. Here's a tag that we didn't use last time that is important to use for a fully compliant document. We need to set our character set. We need to say what language, what character entities, what alphabets can we use in this project. If we were to view this in the browser, it would work fine, but it's not quite defined to show which characters we can use. Meaning, are we only typing in English letters or Spanish letters, Japanese letters, Hebrew letters? So we're going to be we're going to define that we want to activate the variety of characters that are available to us. This is known as a meta tag. It's back up inside of head, one line after the head. Technically, what we're about to write here doesn't matter the order, but it has to be inside of head. We have a tag called meta, M-E-T-A, which does not have a pair. This is the one that doesn't have a pair. But as we saw last time with image, when I didn't have the pair, what else did I have instead? <clears throat> An attribute. So we're going to need an attribute inside this meta tag. C-H-R-S-E-T equals quote, end quote. Here's where we can write our first note. Meta tag that defines our character set. So which alphabets can we use? Which alphabets can we use in this project? It would be assumed, you know, um, Western alphabets, um, you know, English and such. But if we wanted to use other languages, like in Spanish, there's some uh, letters with accent marks on them. If we wanted to use, you know, Gaelic, the Gaelic alphabet, it has various characters as well, Japanese characters, Hebrew characters. Uh, we should define which are valid characters to use in our project. So we're going to use 
in the quotes, UTF-8. Short answer is that that's the one that lets us use all the alphabets. We could say only let us use the alphabets or the characters in Spanish if this was going to be a project only focused in Spanish. Uh, I want to have the ability to use all the characters, so we're using UTF-8. Uh, at the moment, I forget what it stands for, but it's basically all the characters. So we want this as part of our basic skeleton. We'll also add, I recommend at the end of the document, to add a little bit of a comment block where it's useful to have the name of the developer, uh, the project name. It did not finish comment over there, or it scrolled? Name, project date, and description. You should put that at the end, because we're at body. That's right. Um, it's in the body. It's before body ends. Um, since it's valid HTML, it could go anywhere before HTML ends. So sometimes I see people write it between body and HTML. But we would write it there, uh, not after slash HTML or before. So right here you can just fill out whatever, whatever you want here. Um, project name. Let's call this template. Date, today's date, description, our starting point template. Now we did call it up on the title on the H1, something else besides template, that's OK. It's sort of a chicken or the egg. Should we write uh, this sort of comment first and create a template first, or should we start the project? Doesn't matter. But just to confirm that this is working at the moment, Remember our process, we write the code, we save the code, we run the code. So if you see that it's got the little red floppy disk up here, it means you have not saved yet. You can click File Save, you can do Control S, you can click the icon right there, Save, make sure it becomes blue and saved. I'm going to close this change log, you don't have to look at this. Um, you know, you don't have to look at this change log if you don't want. So I'm just going to have one file open in my editor. And then we run and choose any browser. I'll just go with Firefox. It's the first one on the list. So go ahead and write what I wrote. Save it, run it, launch it in Firefox, and see what it looks like. It shouldn't give you any errors. It should behave how we expect. And how we expect is that it simply says something like this. So if your comment also appears, let's pause right there and fix that. Your comment should not appear because it's a comment. So this file, I want to reuse it in subsequent days. It's only about 18 lines. And as you get practice with this, you'll be able to create this quickly. But let's say when we come back on Thursday and we maybe start a brand, brand new document again, I don't maybe want to type it all again, so I want to use this as a template starting point. So let's do this. Once you've saved it, then we can go to Save a Copy As. So it's going to leave the current one open, and then it's going to save a copy somewhere. And that copy that we're about to save, we'll call that one template.html. So file save a copy as in my flash drive, I'll call this template.html. So that's something I can reuse on a subsequent day instead of starting with an empty screen. So on my flash drive, I have on my flash drive, I've got the work from 
Thursday. I got the file I just created right now, and I've got the template file that I did save a copy as. Right. <coughs> Where did you save last time? That you did. In the network folder. You don't have access to the network folder, only the instructors can save into that folder. Can you send us a copy? Talk to, me during, talk to me during the break. Okay. So, this is our starting point file. Um, what I want to do is create a way for people to uh, input their name. Maybe we can manipulate their name a bit and then output it again. So some simple ideas in input and output. So we need a way to be able to give the user a spot to enter their name and a button to get the ball rolling. Since this is, in, this is interactive, we need a way for the user to interact. We're going to need to create a button. We're going to need to create input boxes. They press the button, stuff happens. Something happens on screen, JavaScript. But before that part, we're going to write some more HTML, because the HTML is the basic structure of the project, the content. So I'm going to give myself some new space up here, line 11. We're going to create a form, not a forum, but a form. And right here, HTML tag form used for user input, for capturing user input. You interact with forms all the time. Uh, the most popular website in the world is Google, and it's just a big old form. There's a little box for you to type what you're searching for. You click search, you get a result. It's a form. Its basic syntax is the form tag, ending of the form tag. And there's other attributes and other embellishments we can add to it as we get more complex. But at the very basic, what we've got here is some sort of form that will uh, accept user input. So we need some boxes inside of the uh, form block, inside of the form tag. Uh, let's create an input tag, which does not have a pair, but it has attributes. It has an attribute of type. Basically, what is the type of data that we are collecting? And I want to say text. Save it and run it, and check what it looks like so far. So save your work, run it in the browser. If you typed it correctly, let's see what we get. You get a box. You click in the box, you can type. Now there's nothing else there. There's uh, there's no uh, way for the user then to say like send or submit or go or something that's coming next. Also, from a sort of a design point of view, um, I'm not telling the user what's this box for. So when we make websites or when we make apps, we're going to be covering the concepts throughout the course of user experience uh, and user interface design. Uh, when you use an app, you know, think of the apps you use on a regular basis. Maybe Facebook or Twitter or your banking app or your phone app or WhatsApp or whatever. Think about how maybe the very first time, if you can remember, the very first time you ever used the Facebook app or the first time you ever used Snapchat <coughs> or the very first time you used your, your phone dialer app, you had to learn how to use it for the first time. Then maybe you used it a couple of times and now you're a pro, you can do it with your eyes closed. Well, that's part of the whole concept of user experience and user interface design. How do we create something that makes sense for the person to use? Right now, we know what this is about. They're going to type their name and something's going to happen. We know because we're programming it, or you know, I'm telling you what it's doing. 
But if someone were to visit this website or this app, they wouldn't know what this is about. What do I type here? What's valid to type? It has no user feedback. So let's refine this more. Before our input, we're going to create a, uh, a tag called field set. It's one word. It's all lowercase. And it has a pair. I'm going to wrap field set around that input. So I'll tab input, and then I'll close field set. Field set is used to wrap uh, content around uh, visually for the user. Conceptually, it wraps content. And it also requires something called legend, which has a pair. So this will make more sense once we see what it is in a moment. There's a field set, a legend tag, then an input tag. In between legend, of course, what we write here is Zelda. No, actually, what we write here is whatever we're trying to sort of define what this little area is, this is going to be regarding username. Save it and run it to see what we've done here. And then we'll write some notes about what we've done. Make sure you've got your field set pair. And as I said last time, it doesn't matter if you put, it does not matter if you put uh, your tags and the same line or multiple lines and some t I often go back and forth with the two I personally feel that when uh, When it makes sense to use one line is when you've got something very simple to display on screen But when it's multiple things I like to put it in multiple lines So this would have worked fine if we had it like this. It's just then I think it takes up too much space visually in the code would have done the same result, but because it's one simple uh, piece of content for the user, it's I like to have that on one line. So I'll put that back. And the result looks like this. So now a little bit of visual element. A little box is wrapped around that. This is where we're expecting the person's username to be in here. Um, actually, let's change this a little bit. Let's call this user info, not username, user info. Writing the notes, we could say, field set, groups, form, elements, together. visually and conceptually. This is again related to user experience. You've probably filled out forms, let's say job applications in real life and probably also digitally. And when you're uh, filling out one of these forms, uh, hopefully it's divided up into a bunch of sections where it asks for your home address and another section, uh, your your contact information, phone number and such, and another section about your references. So visually it's divided up. This is part of the purpose of that, a field set. Then legend displays to the user the meaning of the content, of the elements, form elements. Well, the user info that I'm going to ask for is first name and last name. That was also something that was not evident a moment ago. Do I type my full name here? Do I only type my last name, first name? I don't know. Do I type, you know, V Campos? Again, we haven't quite told the user what are we, what are you supposed to type in this box? And I want to ask for a first name and a last name, and I want them in separate input boxes. So. Uh, at the end of the, the line, 
for that input box, we'll add a break, and we'll create another input field of type text as well. And we will see a little later that we have different types of data that we can collect besides text data. What other data do you think there might be? What other basic kind of data? Numbers. We'll be able to collect number data. We'll be able to collect email data. We'll be able to collect telephone data. So right now I'm saying generically text. So if we check out the results at this point, we've got two input boxes. The person still doesn't really know that I want their first name here and their last name there. So you see this is it's not only important to know the tags, the code, it's important to know how to use them, and why to use them. And it's important to think of the person on the other side of the screen. We're programming this, we're, we're in the code view, we're, we know what our goal is, and we often get blinded. I know how this is supposed to look and work, but then your users don't. And it's not that they're that they're dumb or anything like that, it's that we perhaps haven't done the best job possible to convey what do I want from you, the user, or what am I giving you, the user, as your possibilities. So let's make it a little bit more obvious to the user that I want the first name in the first box and I want the last name in the second box. So before input, we'll create a tag called label which does have a pair. Got a space in between both of those. And label is what will appear on screen. That shows the person, the user, we expect here a first name. So we'll say first name. So we've got a tag for a task. All of the 200 HTML tags, in theory, they all have a task. Uh, and it's very, very, very consistent once you know these things. But the purpose of the label tag is used in a form as a way to tell the person, here's what you should be typing in this box. So we can write a note, continuing notes label used to uh, give hints to the user of what should be added or what should be <coughs> what should be input to the box Well, you probably see what we're about to do with the next input box. We need to create another label, and we need to ask, last name should be typed into that. So here's where we can do a few shortcuts. Yes, we're going to need another label, so we can type it in. Here's a shortcut. Very advanced technique. It's called copy and paste. And then you change it, of course. Now, as when we activate the hints, it'll go a little faster. Uh, but uh, obviously, plain old copy and paste that you've probably used all your life with computers works in code very, very well. The catch is you need to make sure your code is working properly first before copying and pasting it, or else you're going to copy and paste an error over and over. I see that all the time. People misspell label. B-L-E instead of B-E-L. So I need a label for my first input and a label for my second input. And then simply the result of that on screen is that then it says first name, last name. And now it kind of makes sense that I'm supposed to type my first name here and my last name there. Technically, we have these labels, but technically they're not exactly linked to the input fields in question. Technically, the web browser doesn't know the web browser doesn't know that this label is linked to this input field simply because it's on the same line doesn't mean anything. 
HTML can technically all be written on one line that goes all the way across the screen, pages and pages and pages to the right. That's very hard for us to read as a person, but it's perfectly fine for the web browser to then process and interpret. So just because it's on the same line doesn't mean it has the meaning that label is linked to input, that this label is linked to this input. So we need to add a few attributes that link this label to this input. We're going to add the label to the first label, an attribute for, F-O-R. This label will be used for this input field if they share the same uh, value, the same name. I'll call this in first name. This attribute is an example of one that we're inventing. There's no such thing as in first name anywhere in the HTML specification. We're inventing it. We're labeling it how we want, in first name. Therefore, since we're labeling it how we want, we could name it as in first name. We could label it as in first name. We could label it as in first name. We could label it as IFN. Anything we want. But as a beginner, I would recommend to be verbose, to be obvious, to be wordy about it until you get a good grasp of shortcuts and such. So the reason I named it like this, in is the prefix that I would like to use for anything related to an input field. If we were dealing with some other element, like we'll talk about later, a div, I would start it off with div and then the rest. If I were attaching an attribute to the whole form, I might call it form or you know fm something. But I'm dealing with input elements specifically one asking for a first name. And I do these capital letters in between the words for readability. Because that's a little harder to read there than this, because it all runs together like one word. With these capital letters, it's a little easier to read. The downside is that you have to be consistent. Because if I call the label in first name with these capitals, and I don't name it exactly like this in the input field, it won't quite work. Case, cases do matter. Uppercase, lowercase does matter. So the way we fully attach this label, this label is going to be used for an element named in first name. This input will be named, will have a name of in first name spelled exactly the same. Even though it looked like it worked a moment ago, this is more technically correct. We have a label that is being used for a certain input. And we make that connection with the for attribute and the name attribute. And they're the same. So make sure you, have, you add the name attribute to the input tag, the input element. <coughs> Use for and name attributes to link them. Okay, based on what we've done here, you should see what we're about to do with last name. In the exact same sort of syntax for last name, I need to add a for attribute to the label, I need to add a name attribute to the input, and I need to name them along the um, scheme that I've developed in last name, or whatever you want to call these things. At any point, if you want to name these things your own certain way that makes more sense to you, that's fine. Uh, just be consistent to how you name these things. Yes? These attributes are more technically correct so that this element is linked with another element. 
And this is even more important when we deal with more things like JavaScript, where we need to read what is in that field to process it. So um, it's more <coughs> for internal purposes, not for the user. They're not going to ever really see this. It's for us for internal purposes so that it fully properly works. Same thing here for in last name. And then I need a name to that input. This is where I do a copy and paste in last name. You've probably seen forms where it also gives you a little hint. OK, it shows first name, last name. But oftentimes, we also see forms that have a little hint inside the box, uh, some sort of placeholder text that kind of tells you, this is what I expect. Because even if we had, OK, first name, last name, or we had something else like an email or a username or something, a person might not quite know uh, exactly the way to, to type it. So we can put in some placeholder text that is there to further guide people what we expect in a box. That's another attribute. We have an attribute called placeholder. So in the input tag, we've got the type attribute. We're accepting text data. The name is this, which is linked to the label. One more attribute, or another attribute, placeholder. And in quotes, I write whatever I want here that guides people what they should be typing in there. So it can be uppercase, lowercase, it can have spaces, you know, wh whatever makes sense. Um, but a placeholder attribute, its purpose is to put placeholder text in that box to guide people what they should type. And the result is something appears there, and it automatically disappears once I start typing. In the old days, programming something like that was pretty complex. We're using the latest version of HTML and CSS and JavaScript. And so we've got this newer attribute, newer within the last 10 years, uh, this newer attribute that allows us to do something that was kind of hard to do in the old days. So do the same thing for last name. Add a placeholder and put whatever you'd like as a placeholder for the last name. And you've got some placeholders. Um, let's say we're also going to ask um, for, uh, okay, first name, last name. Uh, we're going to ask for uh, what's their favorite hobby. Uh, so I want another input box to ask for a hobby. But conceptually, in this first area, the idea of first name and last name is linked together. I want um, instead, then, sort of like another little area to ask for other, you know, like personal info. I've got user info, personal info. And on that personal info, I can ask for, like, what's your favorite band or what's your favorite hobby, etc. So I want to create sort of like a new area to ask for more info. So that means I need a new field set and a new legend and some new inputs. And actually, a new kind of input that we'll see that can be useful. So after our field set here, Let's add another field set. So this will set apart this other information. Legend. Again, very good idea to open and close your tags when they have a pair so that you don't forget the closing pair. And then we'll say um, personal info.
we're going to use a label as before. We'll say hobbies, implying more than one. And if it's not obvious, we'll let them know you can write more than one. So that means instead of having um, one box uh, for them to, to type into, uh, we're, we're going to have multiple lines for them to type into. After the end of label, <coughs> break the line. And here's a new tag, text area. This one does have a pair. It's a very special case. It's a form element. All of these form elements are in the form block. It's related to a form element. And what it does is creates a larger box. So a person can type multiple lines. Um, it's going to need um, it's going to need uh, the name attribute. It doesn't need a type attribute. It needs a name attribute. Uh, and it could have placeholder. You could have placeholder text, so a placeholder attribute. So label for in hobbies text area name in hobbies placeholder now, you may have noticed that uh, the type attribute is red the name attribute is red placeholder attribute is not red that's just a little bug in notepad plus plus I think so if it doesn't appear red placeholder it's fine and remember, it's simply because it's red doesn't mean it's wrong. It, there's no correlation really between the colors of what's right and wrong uh, regarding properly written code. It's just that it's different colors. So uh, don't worry if placeholder did not turn a different color like the other attributes. So you can say, I don't know, skiing, whatever you want. something here. See, is this valid? I think there's a way to make multiple lines, but I have to look that one up. Let's just say we'll have one item in hobbies. OK, so its syntax is a little different. Its purpose is a little different, but I've got some input fields. We've got a pretty cool form looking uh, form set up so far. If your screen is maximized like that, however, the field set seems to go on way too far. That can be fixed with our code that uh, allows us to edit design, which is not HTML. It's <coughs> CSS. So design, the colors, fonts, and sizes and stuff, we'll get to that with CSS. When we then wanted to do something, the interactivity, what is that again? JavaScript. The JavaScript. So we need one more thing here for this form to look kind of complete and usable. When you're dealing with a form after you're finished with it, what do you usually do? Enter, Enter or submit. <clears throat> so we need some sort of submit button. Now let's say I'm writing something and, oops, I want to start over. What kind of other button might you see? A reset or clear button, yeah. So well, let's add a reset button to start over, and let's add in a, a submit button to to submit it to get the process of of um, of interactivity going. Let's add after the field set in another input. This time of type reset. Value clear. So because I'm out of the field sets, I'm out of the boxes. There it is. 
even though we saw the input for first name and last name as a box where you type inside of, there's a special kind of type reset, which basically converts it or processes it or renders it as a button. And this button currently on screen, if you run it, the button says clear. But if you wanted it to say something else, how do you think you do that? Change value. Change value. Yeah, so if you want it to say something else like reset, you change its value. We didn't need a label in this case because the value is already the label for all intents and purposes. What's visual on the screen, what the meaning of this element is, is in the value. Whereas there was no inherent meaning to these boxes before unless we labeled them. This text area had no meaning unless we labeled it. Well, the input of type reset has already a meaning and a value. It's going to reset. Furthermore, with the value, it's explicitly spelled out. Same line, space, another input. Another input tag, but this time of type submit. And with a value, if we don't specify a value, it will automatically have submit query. Very, very sterile. But if we wanted to say something more interesting or user friendly, we would add a value attribute, such as go, or save, or submit, or whatever we want the button to say. We'll do one more thing, then we'll take our first break. Uh, this form, if it's working for you well so far, good. If not, we'll take a break in a moment uh, to check your code. Uh, but at the moment, if I um, load my latest version, I can start to put stuff in here. I can tab and go to the next box and then fill in something here, reading. Um, then I can press go. Nothing quite happened. You know, go would normally have something happen. But let's say I'm then typing over here and actually I'm making a mistake, so I'll reset it. Um, let's say I only want to fill in a first name and last name. Uh, if I press Enter within those two boxes, it, it actually did a submit. If I press Enter inside of the text area, it gives me a new line, so that's a little different. But we've seen that in various forms. You've seen that on various forms in your life that you're filling something in. You press Tab, you go to the next box, or you press Enter, and it submits. So we have that functionality. Um, but I would want uh, required that the person types in a first name and a last name, and it can be optional that they type in some hobbies. I would, of course, want to display that on screen to tell the person this is required and this is optional. But Behind the scenes, I want to program it also that first name and last name are required, hobby is not. So again, in the old days, it required several lines of JavaScript to check, is the field empty? If it's empty, let them know it's empty, it's required, etc. Well, in the modern versions of the code that we learn, um, we have a very simple attribute that will activate uh, that is something required or not. So wherever we want something to be required, we simply add the required attribute. Uh, and this one's kind of an interesting one. Let's go back to the first name, a new attribute. We have two ways to do it. We can do required equals required. Or we could do required, full stop. Both of those do the same thing. I think even required equals true is valid. So we have three ways to make something required. My vote is for the one where you have to type less, meaning you, have to, you can make less mistakes. So if you simply add the required attribute, that's enough. 
although then that sort of changes the syntax that we've always seen some attribute is equal to some value. Attribute equals value, attribute equals value, attribute equals value, and it's redundant, but it's more, you know, syntactically what we're used to. This one kind of breaks the, the <coughs> norm, but it works fine. So you can decide which of the two you like. And the point of that is that when I load up this latest version of the code, I simply try to go to go. These will pop up automatically depending on the browser. One browser might highlight red, another browser might pop up a different way. It depends on the browser. Each one interprets the same basic code in a slightly different way. Each web browser believes its dialect of the code is the right way. Standards are great, but everyone can make a standard. And so here in Firefox, it looks like this. If I try to submit without filling in the required fields, they highlight red and they tell me, please fill out this field. If I wanted to say something else, if I wanted to say, don't forget this, well, that's going to require extra uh, programming. But at the very least now, if I fill in something here and then skip the hobby, it won't give me the feedback of something is missing. If I fill in the hobby and I fill in the last name, but not the first name, it'll tell me the first name is missing. And forms are often the big failure point in a website or an app if they're not properly programmed, if they're not properly secured. Because even though I'm asking first name and last name, what if I type this? One, two, three, four, five, and six, seven, eight, nine, zero. It'll say, great. Didn't say anything about that's wrong. It just requires some input. Even though we said type of input is text, technically it can input numbers, treat them as text. So if we wanted for it to only accept actually alphanumeric, or not numeric, but only alpha letters, there is a way to program it to only accept letters and not numbers. And technically what I can do here is write, you know, John space one, two, three, space gibberish, and it'll say great. It'll accept all of that. So we have to then further program what are <coughs> what are um, valid characters, what are invalid characters, and that'll be for, for a little later. We've spent at this point a little bit of time, and we've got approximately 40 lines of code, counting comments, is what we've got so far. We'll take our break, and we'll start to then set this up to do something with these inputs. It's 7.11, we'll be back at 7.21. If it didn't quite work for you, call me over. Uh, if it worked, take a little break. We'll be back at 721.